Hi, ladies. I think we've given it a few minutes to allow those to join us from around the world in different parts of the United States. So um, I think we can start. Joan, Miss Joan Agajanian Quinn, will you uh, please take it away? Hello, and welcome from the Armenian International Women's Association. I'm Joan Agajanian Quinn, and I had the privilege of being the AWA NGO rep for more than 20 years. I served with Mary Tumayan, who is our UN founder. Our panel today focuses on the problems of Armenian women in Armenia and the diaspora. We have a vast diaspora and we share many of the same problems and issues with them. AWA has engaged in worldwide conferences at locations like London, Paris, Yerevan, Geneva, and Buenos Aires. At these destinations, we've addressed problems and solutions, introduced creatives like authors, musicians, and artists, and invited internationally known guest speakers. Today, you'll hear from our affiliate president, Nicole Nishanyan, then from our panelists, Karne, Michelle, and Maro. They will address the many ways to empower women through different approaches. This year, AWA is celebrating 30 years. Our organization was founded in Boston by Barbara Margarian, the wonderful Olga Prudian, and the musical Eva Medzorian. These three visionaries got together and decided on a mission to be benefit our community of women, the components uh, that would connect us globally. This was a group not aligned to politics or religion. We had guiding factors of inclusiveness, respect, and integrity, and we still do. Those were the things they founded us on. AWA continues to be relevant by empowering and elevating leaders, enhancing education, and connecting our neighbors. It's been our mission to bring to the forefront proactive women of various ages who are diverse in their interests and in their academic backgrounds. Our panel today reflects that mission. I'd like to introduce our LA president, Nicole Nishanyan, who is speaking to us from Newport Beach. She graduated from the University of Southern California, so did I. She got a degree in education, so did I. She taught school just like I did. I married a lawyer and raised twin daughters, Jennifer and Amanda. She married a surgeon and together they're raising their teenage daughters. Nicole and I both followed the lead of our Armenian mothers. They taught us that a woman with determination and hard work can do anything. Nicole, you have the floor. Joan, you're incredible. So um, thank you, Joan, for that wonderful introduction and for your many years of service as the Los Angeles affiliate United Nations representative. You are an incredible fundraiser and always delivered the most incredible, interesting reports from the many conferences you attended over the past 20 years. I would also like to thank the NGO CSW of New York for creating this incredible platform that we are using today. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us for today's in-depth discussion on how women in the diaspora, together with women from Armenia, are blending ideas to promote gender equality. In today's session, we will hear from three distinct perspectives. Women who have worked firsthand in the empowerment of rural women, young girls, and survivors of domestic violence in Armenia. Before we hear from our speakers today, I will give a very brief introduction of each. Karine Udekian is joining us from Armenia. She is the founder and executive director of Quidix. They provide resources to the global Armenian network by launching community projects, implementing educational initiatives, and amplifying marginalized voices. Karine earned a degree in political science and pre-law at Michigan State University and is currently a Columbia University student working toward a master's in nonprofit management. Her involvement in human rights began in Armenia in 2007 as a legal assistant to the Women's Support Center. She founded Quidigs in 2018. 
Mara Matoshin is joining us also from Armenia. They're together. She is the founder and executive director of the Women's Support Center. She is an activist, a feminist, and dedicated to the advancement of women in Armenia. In 2010, she founded the Women's Support Center. She did this to assist and empower women and children who were victims of domestic violence. The center offers comprehensive assistance with social workers, psychologists, and lawyers, as well as having two shelters. Mara was one of the founding members of the Coalition to Stop Violence Against Women. Mara was selected as an expert in the field by Council of Europe to prepare a police guideline for working with cases of domestic violence. Monique Savazlian Talon is joining us from California. She is the founder and CEO of Highest Path, a boutique diversity and inclusion consulting firm specializing in empowering women leaders and building gender-based inclusive organizations. She is a women's leadership and inclusion expert and the author of Leading Gracefully, a woman's guide to confident, authentic, and effective leadership. She has coached and trained hundreds of senior executives and organizations like Microsoft, Deloitte, and Samsung. Monique holds her bachelor's degree in business from San Francisco State University and received her coach training at the internationally known Coaches Training Institute. She is a member of the International Coach Federation and the National Speakers Association. Ladies, welcome. Thank you for participating today. Monique, you have the floor. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Joan. Thank you to Awa for having me on this panel this morning, sharing the stage with Maro and Karine, two amazing women that I personally look up to, uh, dedicating, you know, all of us dedicating a big portion of our time and energy to empowering women, uh, Armenian women uh, in Armenia and globally. I also want to thank the organizers of the NGO CSW conference. I remember exactly a year ago being in New York and being so excited to attend NGO CSW in person, which was going to be my first conference uh, that I was going to attend. And then literally learning that it had been canceled due to COVID-19 and all the hard work of the organizers just kind of going down the drain. And so I'm really happy that at least this year we were able to gather virtually uh, and to carry on this very important tradition in the space of empowering women globally. Uh, so my mission is to empower 1 million women globally to step into unshakable confidence and feminine leadership because I wholeheartedly believe in what the Dalai Lama said. And he said that the world would be saved by the Western woman. So a little bit about me, uh, as Nicole mentioned, I've worked primarily with large Fortune 500 companies all over the world uh, who are dedicated to gender equality. And while it's been great to be able to partner with these types of organizations that really invest in their female workforce, it was personally fulfilling to me to be able to take this knowledge and expertise uh, that, I that I had uh, in developing and designing large scale programs for these organizations and apply it to the nonprofit space. So two years ago, I had the opportunity to move to Armenia. Uh, as you might've guessed, I'm <laughs> from Armenian background, first generation Armenian American. Um, and I had the opportunity to go to Armenia to work with a global NGO that had a presence in Armenia to design and develop women's empowerment programs for rural women. So I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to speak about that experience and share with you some of the learnings and takeaways from my time working uh, as a consultant in Armenia in this space. So first I'll talk about some of the research that we conducted about the status of women in Armenia, which many of you will find interesting and it will lay the, lay the context to what I'll be speaking about as it relates to empowering rural women. So some background, uh, Armenia is classified as a lower middle income country with an estimated per capita GDP of 3,525 according to the World Bank. That's $3,525. Uh, per capita GDP. 
Uh, in 2016, a proportion of the population living below the national poverty line was 29.4%. And women comprise more than half, 57% of the poor population in Armenia. So the risk of poverty for women headed households in rural communities is obviously higher than in urban communities, 45% and 41% respectively. So in essence, uh, rural women are poor uh, in Armenia uh, and uh, they comprise more than half of the poor population. When we look at education, Armenia is pretty unique as a developing country in that it uh, has near gender parity when it comes to education between men and women. So there's not a whole lot of difference between the education level between men and women. But this does not translate into gains in the workforce, especially in traditionally male dominated fields like in STEM. And because STEM is correlated with higher paying jobs, we saw a mismatch in the types of jobs women were getting, which were in lower paying sectors that were traditionally female, like in education, social sciences, art, health, etc. And of course, gender stereotypes were also a factor that prevented women from entering the workforce after completing their education. Um, and we saw that this was another reason for the gender pay gap. So while female labor resources is, is larger than that of men, um, only 53% of women are ac economically active compared to 71% among men. And we also saw that women made up 68% of unemployed peoples in Armenia. So in many developing countries, we see these trends, but what makes Armenia a little bit different is, is that the women in Armenia are highly educated, but that does is not translating into economic empowerment. So they're not actually um, entering the workforce and, and maximizing their earning potential. So I thought I would share some of the approaches that we took in looking at how we could improve those statistics. Um, and in, in this case, our research team looked at what were some of the major systemic problems as it related to gender equality across the board. Um, and we looked at all areas. So we looked at health, we looked at ec economics, education, legislation to really understand the reasons why women were not equally represented in those sectors. And then we picked a set of criteria to run an assessment to determine which of these areas, if we were to improve them, would have the most impact, meaning we could, we could deliver the highest rate of return on their investment and which was most aligned with the organization's values and strengths. So we ran a full analysis and we identified three main areas that would provide the biggest change towards more gender equality and that were aligned with the NGO's goals. And those were number one, providing new skills to women in the IT sector to create higher paying jobs in that growing sector in Armenia. Number two, providing leadership skills to create female leaders and to really shatter gender stereotypes. And number three, providing general workplace fundamental skills. So of course, other areas were also important like improving quality access to affordable health care and improving national legislation on gender equality. Um, but it was decided that those areas were not in the scope of the NGO's charter. Uh, and the NGO already had a women's entrepreneurship program that was quite successful. So they chose to go with the three areas I identified, which felt complementary to their existing initiatives. So as a sort of a global NGO focused on women's empowerment, they decided to, to go um, the economic empowerment route. And I'll just add that domestic violence was one of the areas that were also identified as being an area that needed to be addressed. Um, and so we decided to partner with Mara's organization, the Women's Support Center, as a strategic partnership to be able to leverage their expertise in that area and provide additional resources so they could continue to scale their impact. And I'm sure Mara will be able to speak to what they do in a few minutes. 
So I'd like to move now to talk a little bit about the design of the programs and some of our learnings from that experience. Um, it just so happened, <laughs> we began the design phase of these programs around January of 2020. And as we got into March, uh, as we all know and remember, things began to shut down due to COVID. And it became clear that we needed to rethink the design and implementation of our programs because originally we had been planning these programs to be in person. But with quarantines coming into effect, it became clear very quickly that that was not going to work and we were going to have to design our programs to be virtual, which I'll speak to in a second, um, which really became a blessing in disguise uh, because it forced um, not only us, but the entire country to quickly transition to virtual formats, uh, whether that was in the economic sector with all companies pivoting to working virtually, literally overnight, um, or schools who ended up conducting their schoolwork uh, virtually. Um, so literally overnight, the country had to quickly get up to speed um, and adapt to working and learning online. So what would have otherwise been a barrier to entry became an opportunity for us as we were designing our programs. Um, and we ultimately decided to design our programs to be virtual based meaning all of our workshops and trainings are going to be done online. And this in and of itself meant we were going to be able to reach more women and provide these programs for more women than we had originally budgeted and planned for without the actual budget spend. So I'll get to that in a minute. So luckily this happened early on in our design phase and we didn't have to lose too much time pivoting our design um, we decided to build our programs on an internal virtual platform that is run by Moodle. Some of you may be familiar with this uh, learning platform. Um, we had used this in the past on a smaller scale, so we decided to leverage this to our advantage and use it as an internal uh, virtual learning platform, um, which then acted as sort of an internal classroom where we hosted all our materials. Um, and for those of you who have used Moodle in the past, you know there are pros and cons to this platform, but for the most part, it allowed us to do what we needed to do for a fraction of the cost it would have cost us if we had to build a new platform from scratch. And I think this gave us another competitive advantage in providing a scalable solution uh, for our uh, overall goals. So we ended up building three new programs, uh, the IT skills building program for women, the leadership program and the workplace fundamentals program, uh, all on our internal virtual learning platform, which had a sort of blended learning component. Uh, so the two programs, the IT program and the leadership program used live workshops with a trainer along with uh, homework and other assignments. Uh, so it was designed uh, so that participants interacted with one another on live sessions. Uh, the Workplace Fundamentals program, however, was 100% self-learning, where pr participants had access to videos and quizzes that they were able to complete on their own time without an instructor. Um, and so uh, this was a sort of a unique thing that had never really been done in Armenia um, and is now a you know, self-sustaining, a standalone program that can be scaled at large. Um, so I was uh, uh, present uh, and led the leadership program um, and the workplace fundamentals program for one cohort. It was our pilot program. Um, and so I, I don't have data about kind of the long term metrics of any of these programs, but from the preliminary surveys that were done, we did see an average of 15% increase in knowledge and an 80% participation in the online learning. Uh, for the leadership program itself, as well as 100% participation in the fundamentals class, uh, because we made that a prerequisite to the final grade in the leadership program. So women were incentivized to, um, to, to do the self-learning uh, workplace fundamentals uh, as part of their final grade for the leadership program. So we kind of wrapped those two in one course, if you will. So just to wrap up here, I wanna share with you some of the takeaways and learnings from this pilot program that 
might be helpful for all of you as you build out your uh, women's empowerment programs. Um, number one, it's imperative to analyze your market or the country you're operating in to really understand what are the problems and which are the best levers to push in order to see the highest rate of return as it relates to gender equality before you design programs. Um, I think it's really easy to kind of assume and think that you know what the problems are, but especially as uh, you know, someone coming from the outside, it was really helpful for, for me to have data that was relevant to what was actually happening on the ground. Um, and, and this helped us kind of, I think, design programs that were very targeted in creating sustainable solutions. Um, so number two, once you've chosen the top one to three areas to address, build scale into your design from the get-go. Now in this post COVID day and age that we're living in, it makes more sense for us now more than ever to think about leveraging virtual learning as a means to scale our programs and reach more women for a bigger impact. And uh, although Armenia is a small country, geographically it is very spread out and women who live in rural areas um, are, are far from one another and so uh, traditionally, we would, you know, uh, pay for them to drive into the capital of Yerevan to attend in-person uh, in-person workshops, uh, which was obviously an additional cost for us, but also an additional logistical thing for them to be able to to organize uh, in order to come to, uh, you know, maybe five or six hours away, come to to Yerevan for a full day workshop. Once we eliminated that hurdle we were able to reach women in, in more remote areas that I think uh, you know, maybe we would not have been able to reach otherwise. Number three, uh, scaling programs virtually can mean maybe a larger upfront investment, but then save a lot of money in subsequent years where the financial investment decreases considerably on a per, per, per participant basis. Um, so, for workplace fundamentals, you know, there was an upfront cost in developing those videos and online materials. But once that is up and running, which it is now, you know, we can use that um, not only for our own purposes, but potentially for uh, sharing it with other organizations who might want to take advantage of that of that uh, material. Um, so that upfront cost actually is, you know, um, goes a long, long way um, in reaching more women. And number four, um, we did not see any major indicators of decreased level of participation or learning with the virtual platform um, in the initial stages, although this would require continued monitoring and analysis. Um, I know that some of the women expressed some you know, disappointment that they couldn't meet each other in person. Uh, and voiced uh, a desire to do so in the future. Um, but in terms of their participation, in terms of their um, you know, retention of knowledge, uh, it didn't seem like the virtual platform had any negative side effects or negative results. So in conclusion, I wanna say that we all know the ROI on empowering rural women and uh, the alignment with the UN Sustainable Development Goals is is very important. And I think we all have an opportunity um, as uh, women who work in NGOs in a post COVID world to think about how we can maximize our funds through scaling our programs and leveraging virtual learning to reach more women and make a bigger impact. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share these learnings with all of you. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have during the Q&A. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Monique, for that. Very informative. Uh, Mauro, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, I, I cannot go for, uh, uh, further on without thanking CSW, because when I started, to me, CSW uh, opened the door to so many worldwide uh, organizations and allowed me to to see what's happening in the world uh, and, and be in touch with other feminists. And it was really a, an exchange information and know-how and knowledge. So CSW has been really like a mentor to me. 
And I want to particularly say also thank you to Iowa, who is a founding member of um, Women Support Center, and to this day continues to support us. Um, and especially to Joan, who um, uh, she's really a, a support, a, a strong supporter of Women Support Center, and also a personal donor to the to the to the organization. Thank you, Joan, again, to, to do this initiative, which is so important. Mauro, you uh, have been fantastic, Mauro. And we all you. know it. We all bless you for what you've done. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. So I will talk about um, uh, empowerment of victims of domestic violence. And uh, as you know, this is a worldwide problem. Um, and it exists in the diaspora for Armenian women and in Armenia. Um, uh, we all know that uh, violence is always wrong, that no one deserves to be hurt. No matter what they said, did, were, or thought, violence is never justified. The perpetrator, not the survivor, is the responsible for the violence, and survivors have made the best choices and decisions possible, given the constraints, fears, feelings, and circumstances. So, when we talk about the empowerment in domestic violence, we deal with a model that we implement uh, with, with these survivors. And the empowerment model is the one that is a must for dealing with victims of domestic violence. It is a model that is used throughout the world by professionals, professional organizations in the field of domestic violence. What the survivor experiences in an abusive relationship is a pattern of controlling behaviors. Her abuser feels the right to make all her decisions for her, telling her what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. In the past, this dynamic has often been recreated by well-meaning service providers with approach, uh, who approach victims with a rescuer, quote unquote, a rescuer mentality, telling her how, when, and what she needs to do uh, to, in order to recover and get on with her life. So basically she was replacing the abuser and telling her what to do and, and, and taking control of her life. Even well intentioned, but nevertheless, uh, the service provider would do the same thing. Even though service providers are helping her in the short term by doing everything for her, they leave her in a similar position of uh, to how she felt in the abusive relationship, completely helpless. In the long term, it is detrimental to her success if everything is done for her because she will not feel capable and will not have learned the skills to take care of herself and her children. Over time, as professionals gain, gained more experience working with survivors, they learned that what victims need most is somehow, someone to support their decisions, encourage and reinforce their strength and provide resource, resources to achieve their goals. Survivors are most successful when they are in control of their own healing journey. This is very important. This approach is called empowerment. So, there are fundamental assumptions about this that the survivor has incredible strength and healing capacity. It may take time and be difficult, but every survivor can move through their own healing process. The needs of each and every survivors are different. So it is not a, like a formula that you put in, into place. Someone will only do what is right for them if they believe they can. Services must support and affirm self-efficacy. So, the first steps to empowerment is to um, create safety for the victim. And the safety is comprised of two aspects, the physical safety and the emotional safety. The physical safety we provide by removing the person or, or when the person removes herself from the danger, from the physical danger. Um, when they are uh, safe from speaking on the phone freely, and um, when and when she comes to our office or our shelter, she feels safe um, and 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 uh, welcomed. Of course, the emotional safety 
is that we provide confidentiality. So in other words, when the victim comes to our center, she knows that all the information she provides, it's kept confidentially. Uh, we establish the relationship of trust and we believe in them, uh, not judging them, and but respecting them. Listening, it's very important. These women were never listened. Nobody believed them. Nobody uh, gave them support. So, and also do away with any blame. Um, it's very important because sometimes women may appear to us uh, as not uh, credible or, um, you know, uh, not dressed properly, whatever misconceptions we might have, but that we have to put aside and we just have to listen and believe them. So um, the key elements to the empowerment model is that the survivor, not us, is the leader of their own healing process. We are not a survivor's rescuer. Our role is to support and assist and connect survivors to resources. And we are like an anchor. They can lean on us. We are successful when the client no longer needs us. And... Uh, it's, very, it's also very important that we are able to uh, build self-esteem because, you know, um, many times these women, when they come to us, it's, um, they're shattered. Their self-esteem, their uh, belief in themselves, their, um, even their capacity of, um, uh, of strength, in, in inner strength, it's completely shattered. So it's important that we tell them that um, I, I care and you deserve better than this, to encourage activities and skills that they are good and feel proud of. It's, uh, it's amazing how when they come to us and we ask them, you know, what can you do? They said, I do nothing. I, 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 I'm not capable of doing anything. And the reason for that, it's not because they're not, they're not that incapable. It's because for years and years, their partner told us that you're worthless, that you cannot do anything, that without me, you are nobody. So we you start to restore that back. And when we ask them, for example, remember, what were you doing before you got married? And sure enough, they start telling the stories. I used to sew very well, cook very well, whatever they used to do. I was an accountant. You know, and uh, it's amazing how slowly we bring back those skills back to them and make them feel good about it and proud about that. Uh, we cannot be their only support system. We brainstorm with them. So who in their life can support them? But we have to be very careful about that because sometimes parents and relatives try to thinking that they are doing good. They're doing exactly what the abuser does, taking the over, you know, and telling them you have to do this, you have to do that, go here, do this, and again, leaving them helpless um, and, and, and not be able to make decisions for themselves. We encourage them, encourage them to do activities and to uh, with other people also, uh, to go to uh, vocational schools, to take a, co a class, to start work, to interact. Uh, we offer options, not advice present each, each option equally without judgment or bias towards uh, which is best option. So we discuss the pros and the cons with them. And basically we give them information for them to make decisions. And sometimes uh, the decisions that are, they're making, they're not maybe the right decisions for them, but we respect that and we let them do. This is the way they learn. And it takes time. If you remember, even, uh, uh, it's known that a survivor might go four or five times back to the abuser, but that we have to respect. And um, eventually they will come to the realization of what is right. Uh, each client's process is individual and they have to guide us uh, uh, what needs to happen next. They know best to what, how to handle their life. Uh, we help clients understand their emotions and bodily reactions to normalize these reactions. Why? Because uh, as you know, uh, women are uh, victims of domestic violence, suffer from trauma. Sometimes, sometimes they have um, uh, flashbacks and they can be very paralyzing. And when you are at work, sometimes you completely disconnect and you cannot perform a task. So um, we, we tell them that this can happen 
and it's normal and how to we teach them calming techniques. So in conclusion, all these techniques, approaches and um, uh, are um, uh, providing empowerment to the survivors. Uh, and we have to say that we have a lot of success with our survivors. Um, and we see how they come to our office feeling helpless, um, with the hair not washed, no makeup, and all of a sudden they started to blossom, take charge of their lives, reintegrate in society, and uh, being able to take care of their families, uh, providing, um, providing for their families on their own. And this is a great success story that we are able to take women from abusive relationship, from a life of fear, and, and uh, abuse to reintegrate in society and uh, be, be successful. Uh, thank you to all. And I give my mic, <laughs> my mic. mic I give the Karin. mic to Karin. <laughs> I just also want to add um, that I'm very thankful to have this opportunity to be in this virtual room with all these phenomenal women. Earlier today, we had an event where we were celebrating phenomenal women in Armenia. And I came from that so inspired and I'm so excited to speak with you all. So thank you for having me. Um, and what I discuss, I'm definitely going to reference my organization that I started. Uh, the organization is called Quidigs, and it's a nonprofit organization and a registered NGO here in Armenia. And essentially, the goal of Quidigs is to provide resources to Armenian women and marginalized communities. And at the same time, while doing that, um, provide a platform and place for people to truly connect and form community. Um, and kind of going off of what Monique was talking about, you know, about the power of having virtual technology. Truly, Quidix has allowed me to connect women both in the diaspora and within the motherland, which is a link that I feel like we often don't acknowledge um, oftentimes. So for those of you um, who may want a little bit of a historical reference, in 1915, there was an Armenian genocide. And as a result, Armenian people were spread all over the world. Um, since then, a lot of the youth has not connected unless there was a special event, a family wedding, um, things of that nature. And there's wonderful organizations, you know, like AWA and other groups that have created events to bring people together. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's difficult when the only times you get to bond with other Armenians, especially before COVID, um, um, was physical events in person. So in creating Quidigs, I really came from a point of, quite frankly, being a bit fed up with being oppressed within my own community, feeling sick of other women within my own community shaming me, feeling feeling that pressure that they felt of the patriarchy on them that they then projected to others as well. Um, and when I say that, it's, it's growing up as an Armenian girl. It, it was a great experience because I grew up with so much culture um, and rich history, which I absolutely loved. At the same time, there's a lot we need to work on within our culture. So in creating Quidigs, one of the first things we did was have a forum, an online forum. And this forum essentially asked, it was me kind of screaming into the internet and saying, Armenian women, share your experiences with taboo topics. So share your experiences with, you know, sex ed conversations and share your experience with conversations about domestic violence, share your experiences with conversations about things that often aren't addressed within our community because of social convention. And the beauty of having technology is the fact that you can also submit these stories anonymously. Um, and one thing, especially young people, specifically um, teenage girls love to do is hear each other's stories, right? Mm -hmm. So when you create a platform that allows for people to share one another's stories without the stigmatization, without the shame, you get a lot of vulnerability and you build a sort of community that truly hadn't been, um, I would say hadn't had a platform to thrive um, within, within specifically Armenians. And as I said, because we have such a rich diaspora around the world, we were all able to connect over that platform. Now, fast forward, right? This was in 2018. I'm only 23 years old. So I'm coming from a place of empowering young women as a young woman. So I think I know, <laughs> I think I know what we're kind of looking for, which is where I really drew the value. And in the way I created content and the way I projected media was a way that was 
feels very palpable to young people, um, not over complexifying things, making things very accessible, understandable to people both in Armenia, which includes a lot of the time speaking Armenian, which includes a lot of the time being on ground and understanding, like we said, what people are going through. That was something else Monique mentioned is working on a needs basis. And that's really what I want to emphasize in this talk is that with what Mato does, what Monique was saying, everything is really important to go from a place of what needs to be addressed. And what I want to truly address at this point is the burden that was placed on women, young women, old women, um, specifically throughout the war that took place in Armenia last year. There was a war um, in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, is how it is politically addressed. Um, and quite frankly, as all the men left the country to defend the front lines um, in this battle for self-determination, the women not only had the burden of taking care of their homes, which is the role that's assumed a lot of the time in Armenian culture. But on top of that, they also had to provide aid. And this starts at a very young age. This was kind of like an all hands on deck situation. So when you have young girls that are already going through experiences of, you know, puberty and growth and crushes and whatever it may be. And then you add the trauma of a war on top of that. Now, not only are we addressing stigmatized taboos and topics like periods, but we're talking about loss. We're talking about death. We're talking about the burdens placed on young women to now provide for their families because their brothers and their fathers have passed away because they were defending front lines. And they still have a little brother at home who sees that as his destiny. So when we talk about empowering Armenian women, we need to take into consideration, the politics that surround this as well, um, on an international scale, and the impact we can all have in speaking out about that and acknowledging that as well. Um, so when I talk about the work of Puidi, specifically, we've been working on a project called Project Maidi, which essentially means mother in Armenian. And this is about providing resources to women, which is young women um, in Armenia. People do get married at a fairly young age. I'd say 23, most people are already married here on average. Um, and, and they start to, to make children because that's kind of the social convention is, you know, you get married, you start having babies, um, which is wonderful and beautiful. And that's a part of life, as we know. Um, but with that comes a great amount of responsibility that is now placed on women whose husbands, A, have been martyred in the war, B, are still fighting on the front lines. Um, and this specifically impacts pregnant women. Um, so in talking about pregnant women, there were not a lot of resources that were allocated during the war to providing aid to this extremely marginalized community especially at a time of high PTSD, heavy trauma. We see an increase in miscarriages. We see an increase in premature births. Um, the hospitals were quite frankly booming with premature births during COVID on top of everything. Um, and it comes to a point where these women were displaced from their ancestral homelands, displaced from Artsakh, left sometimes on the street with six children. Mado, I worked with Mado on this project quite a bit and she would call me and say, you know, there's this family, they have nowhere to stay, we need to figure something out. And within the next two hours, um, we'd figure out arrangements for them. And that was kind of how me and Mado became buddies. <laughs> that, was, that was kind of the story of how Mado became my mentor, um, is this all, all hands on deck approach. But specifically young women are an extremely marginalized uh, group during war. And so what Project Mydik did is provide them with a six month plan um, from either when they had the baby or a few months before, essentially wherever they are in their phase of pregnancy, we are promising them six months of care um, and security. So we provide them with whatever medication they need, prenatal vitamins, which sometimes are the same price as their rent in Armenia. You would have, you know, if their rent is $120, well, so is their medication to prevent them from having a miscarriage. So there's all sorts of things that we have to take into consideration when we talk about gender equality and the investments that we have to make in not only the women and their health themselves, but the generation that they're bringing forth. Um, so that's, that's my major point is that we need to do whatever we can to ensure, yes, if, if society is going to tell Armenian women or women generally, you know, have babies, you know, go within this kind of, uh, this path. Yeah, yeah exactly. We also need to be able to support that. And we also need to be able to ensure that those children coming into the world have the resources that they need to continue to thrive and equal education and access to these opportunities, specifically following the war when there are hundreds of thousands of displaced people um, that are now 
pregnant and, you know, being bringing more life into the world. Um, so with Queedigs, our goal is not only to create this online safe space, but to translate that into real life and to really promote inclusivity for women, for people who don't identify as women, non-binary people, whoever needs the help so they can access it and their families can access it as well. Because that's another factor we have to talk about is the inclusivity of NGOs that are on the ground um, and what the accountability looks like for that. Because I think there aren't enough conversations about that as well. And that's why it's really important to be on ground and see what your um what the people you're working with, who they are, and get to know them personally. And from this project, My Dig Experience, we have met so many phenomenal women who have so much potential, who have so much drive. Um, and I don't think it's a matter of convincing Armenian women a lot of the time that they can do something. It's that they were never presented with the opportunity to do it to begin with. Um, so if you just allowed those doors to be open or you created a path, it'd be a lot easier. I mean, they'd walk it. I know they would walk it. But the problem is that that doesn't exist right now um, as much as it should. And that's what Mato has been working on for years. And that's what I hope to continue um, in fulfilling that legacy and providing resources to Armenian women. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> That yeah. was that was beautiful, Karina. You you made me tear up. So your path, <laughs> um, it's um, it's very admirable and very commendable. So um, um, so I have a, a, a question, um, and I have and I have some questions that we've also been been getting. Um, the path from education. So the women are being educated, and then where's the disconnect from? Then they're not going into those jobs. I understand the push and the force for them to get married right away. But how can how can we bridge that gap between education, self-independence and a job, and also you can get married if you want? Any Anybody can answer that, starting with, uh, we, we could start with Kari Neymaro and then end with Monique. Sure. Um, well, just based on observations of being in Armenia, there's definitely an age limit that's put on women to work. Um, I feel like, well, even if you're talking about, you know, working in a mall as one of your first jobs, one of the things they judge you most harshly on is how you look and your appearance. And that's just a given. And I think the lack of accountability for hiring practices in Armenia is something that has to change. Um, and those are things that when there aren't women in those decision making roles as the head of those corporations and companies that are working in Armenia, then you see that trickle down effect of, you know, hire people who are pretty, hire people who are young. And these are personal experiences of friends I've had um, that haven't been hired by different people. I mean, and when you're talking about the opportunities that exist within the field, now we're seeing a real emergence of tech, which is really important in Armenia. And I definitely recommend everybody who's in this panel to look into the tech industry, because I think that's where we're going to see a lot of positions start to open up for women. And that's what has been happening, I'd say, over the past five years, especially. Well, uh, to add to that, uh, Karine uh, uh, pointed out the important aspects, but uh, we have to remember that Armenia is a patriarchal society uh, fed by a lot of gender stereotypes. In the Soviet times, uh, everybody had to work and the uh, uh, distribution of, of work uh, uh, um, placements was more equitable. However, when the open uh, market uh, system came about, all of a sudden we started to hear the discourse that women should stay at home and take care of the children. And that is to allow the fewer jobs available to be taken up by men. And uh, we see that a lot of the times nowadays, the management positions are that of men and the service provide provision uh, uh, jobs are that of women. And uh, we see less and less, uh, because of also the scarcity of, of jobs, but we see less and less women in uh, sciences, less and less women in uh, important um, uh, higher paid positions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, again, now for the same job, we see a discrepancy of, in salaries of 30% between men and, and women. And, um, and women, uh, as I said, are uh, hired for uh, lesser paid jobs. So, um, and also uh, while more uh, girls um, uh, receive higher education than boys who go into army or then they go into private sector, 
Then again, uh, when it comes, for example, to PhD level, uh, there is there are more men than women. So um, yes, these discrepancies exist, and I think it it really stems from um, discrimination, as as uh, Karine said. It uh, stems from patriarchal society, and also from uh, labor laws that are not really strong enough to avoid discrimination and um, to to have more equitable um, placement of women in the marketplace. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, I mean, what Karina and Maro said uh, is exactly spot on. I think what ends up happening is when you have these gender stereotypes of, you know, the woman needs to get married, have children, uh, and that's really her only, you know, path in life. Uh, what begins to happen is women begin to believe that that's their only opportunity, that that's the only path that they can take. And so these patriarchal belief systems become ingrained in women and women end up perpetuating that to other women. So a lot of times the mother, uh, especially if it's a beautiful woman uh, and especially in rural areas, will prefer for her daughter to get married and even get married to a man that she has never met in a different town or a different place, rather than send her to the city to be educated and to enter the workforce, because there's this belief that she might, you know, something could happen to her because she's beautiful. Um, and so these kind of, you know, per, you know, this, these stereotypes get ingrained in female psyches, and it's passed down through uh, generations, um, where women don't have any kind of uh, support system or pathway available to them to get out of that cycle. So as, as uh, Karina mentioned, when we're able to show them that pathway and give them those opportunities, they jump for it. Um, they are, you know, highly educated, as we mentioned. Um, they, uh, you know, are ambitious, but because of these ingrained stereotypes that are very difficult to overcome, a lot of times they get, get stuck and unable to get out of that cycle. Okay, um, so Maro touched on laws in Armenia and we had someone who's um, attending our panel um, named Emily and Emily has a question. How is the judicial, judicial system in Armenia? For example, in the United States, survivors of domestic violence are often mandated to attend certain programs while the perpetrator is not accountable. So can you explain some of the laws in Armenia with domestic violence or does, um, um, I think what they probably meant to say was, um, is the perpetrator held accountable or is it just the woman who feels the shame? What's the, what's the, um, the feeling in Armenia of a victim of domestic violence versus the person who commits the violence? This is such a complex question, uh, you know, to do, <laughs> I would need like an hour to just discuss that. But uh, suffice to say that Armenia passed a domestic violence law recently, which started to be implemented in 2019. So we have a very brief experience with legislation for domestic violence. Um, the law is not perfect and amendments to the law and to the criminal law, uh, the criminal code, are in process right now uh, uh, to be done. And even then it's like a first phase of amendments. We still need improvements and improvements. Um, uh, the law uh, says that the abuser is accountable and, uh, uh, but however, the punishment is not clear yet uh, on the abuser. So if the perpetrator has uh, committed physical abuse that can be um, pro proven, uh, then there are uh, fines or even jail term. Um, however, however, not all the time the perpetrator is uh, made accountable of his uh, actions because we have policemen who tend to side more with the perpetrator and um, in this sense, in this society where the man feels entitled uh, 
and the sense of entitlement that exists, many times they put the perpetrator above that of the victim. And uh, whatever, you know, we know that laws are very good on paper sometimes, but not implemented well. So we have a long way to go. Uh, I have to say that in the United States, it took about 40 years to improve the, the situation, the, 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 the way we address and the way we um, uh, provide uh, safety and uh, for survivors. But, and we need to go to, a, to, a, to incremental changes and it takes time. But uh, women organizations are not only to provide services to the victims, but also to do advocacy. And together with other women organizations in Armenia, we put a lot of pressure on the government to be able to make changes and change their attitudes. And when we notice problems on the ground, we uh, advocate for change and we try to improve uh, those um, uh, the, the problems that exist. I think Joan, yeah. Maro, sometimes uh, many countries now are having um, systems where the person who's been abused is afraid to go forward. So they have implemented a way for other people to help with that abused woman, some way that they can report what's going on. Do, are we having that? Are we seeing that at all? Well, uh, the the one good thing about the law is that when there is a severe crime, um, then uh, and even even though the woman does not want to um, uh, 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 um, what you call it, to press it's charges, it. yeah, yeah, yeah they, they, the the state presses charges, <clears throat> so that's that's a good thing. But yes, the vast majority they don't want to press charges, and. Um, uh, it, it, yeah, it, it creates a problem. But uh, there are many reasons why not, and we have to uh, respect the, the wish of the victim. Thank you for that. Um, we have someone who has lived in Armenia who has asked a question, Marissa, asks, um, does the woman have control over the contraception that she practices when she's married, or does someone in the family have control over the contraception? Uh, um, you know, uh, sex education in Armenia is lacking. Mm -hmm. And you find women who have never heard of contraception and women who uh, don't have access to contraceptions because of the cost of it. Um, and then women who their lives is so controlled that um, by mother-in-laws or by husbands that they don't allow them to have contraceptions. Um, in Armenia to encourage births, uh, the government um, pays um, money for each child being born. So after the second child, the third, the fourth, there's a, a significant amount of money that they receive. And uh, sometimes uh, women are used to produce children just to gain some, uh, money. Mm -hmm. um, so, so contraception is available um, uh, in um, uh, contraceptive pills and IUDs, but not all women have access and not we, we, all women benefit from it. Uh, sometimes abortion is still considered the easiest way mm -hmm. uh, of, of, uh, of preventing uh, unwanted uh, pregnancies. And um, uh, yes, we need more uh, awareness uh, to be raised in women and uh, knowledgeable about uh, their body, knowledgeable about what's available for them and uh, made aware of, um, uh, you know, means to, to protect themselves for, for one of the pregnancies. And I just want to add, um, there was a study by UNFPA that said that around 40% of all Armenian women have had an abortion. There was another study done in the 90s. I don't quite believe what it was, but it said that on average by the age of, age of 40, um, Armenian women have had around eight abortions, a median amount of eight abortions. And when we talk about this, we also need to amplify the issue of sex selective abortions, which there was legislation that was recently passed on that. Um, but part of a patriarchal society is that men are valued
valued more than women um, to society. And as a result, we see that a lot of pregnancies are ended early. Now, as a result of that legislation that we saw, I'd say, what was it, five years ago? Uh, uh, I think it was five years ago now. Um, Women cannot have ultrasounds until a certain point. I think, I believe it's like nine weeks into the pregnancy. It might be 12, 12 weeks into the pregnancy. Um, So they don't see the gender of the baby. And then it's at that point um, too late for an abortion is, you know, illegal for for an abortion um, within the country. And so there's a lot of legislation that's been introduced um, very recently, not a lot, but, you know, there's that one major piece, but we're still dealing with that issue. And that does root just from a patriarchal society. Um, And that's why we see abortion as the main form of contraception in Armenia still. So, uh, Monique, do you uh, address any of those things in your programs, or have you? So, not in the not in the programs that I was working in as a consultant, but I personally uh, have done a lot of work in the area of healthcare in Armenia uh, as it relates to women's healthcare. Um, and I believe that uh, improving the access and the quality to women's healthcare in Armenia is going to be a major factor in empowering women across the board. Because if you have women who are suffering from health issues uh, because of abortions, um, because if you have women who are continuously having more children and are unable to enter the workforce, these are things that, you know, basically limit her ability to be a productive member of society, not to not to say that she's not as a mother, but uh, when she's unable to provide for her family uh, financially, um, a lot of times also what ends up happening is because of the low um, uh, employment opportunities, men in Armenia migrate to other countries to find Uh, job opportunities. And so you'll see men leaving the country, leaving their families for extended periods of time. And then the full burden of, you know, uh, uh, taking care of the household, the finances, everything falls on the woman. And again, she's unable to really, you know, lift herself out of that situation. Um, And a lot of times these men come back um, with, you know, Uh, STDs and, you know, pass that on to their wives. And then, you know, the cycle continues. Um, And so when I was in Armenia visiting uh, the clinics in the rural areas, um, I was shocked (laughs) at the poor level of healthcare available to these women. A lot of these clinics are not, uh, they're not getting a lot of funding from the government, unfortunately. And the aid organizations that are there uh, are not able to really, you know, make the impact that's necessary in a lot of these rural villages. A lot of the clinics are very difficult to access. So uh, for pregnant women, uh, the closest maternity hospital might be an hour away. And so they're not able to get the the quality care that they need during pregnancy, uh, which could lead to complications. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done in that area. But Monique, you talked about your work going virtually to those rural areas. How do they have access and do, and does your program only have access to Armenia or can people from all over the world get on it? Uh, so the program that we developed uh, was uh, developed in Armenian. So unfortunately... Oh, uh, it is in Armenian. Oh, I see. Yes. So it's only accessible for uh, women in Armenia at this point. Uh, there was some talks about, you know, is this something that could be interesting for diaspora and Armenian women? Uh, that's a decision that still needs to be made. Um, but, uh, but yes, it, it's right now it's only accessible for for women in Armenia. And do they get it in the rural areas? They do. Yeah, one one thing that we found is that most everybody, even in rural areas, is connected to the internet. So they have either a mobile phone or a computer and internet access. Uh, Armenia is fortunately very advanced uh, technologically in that respect. And so that was not a barrier to entry at all. And does that help your program, Quidix, Karen A? If I'm going to be completely honest, I don't think there's a great access to technology in the areas that we're working, especially within Artsakh, because we just went through a war. Everything was 
quite literally blown up as a result of war crimes by Azerbaijan. Um, so what we're seeing right now is really a lack of access to technology, lack of access to tel telephones and cell phones. Um, and we are living in modern society. So when you come into Yerevan, um, you definitely see that people have cell phones, people have Instagram, TikTok. Um, and along with that, I just want to add to this conversation that, you know, people in Yerevan aren't living in the stone age. I mean, teenagers have sex like these things are happening um and and as you increase influence of media to the main city specifically there's a natural progression of you know even you see it in fashion and everything in media and there's a progressiveness that's going around which i think is really cool um because when i thought of armenia i thought it was all extremely traditional and i have a fantastic group of friends here that are more progressive and that's great and all um but when you go immediately outside of yerevan and you go further and further out it's very difficult um for people to have access to these things specifically after a war um and, you know, the Internet hasn't been great lately as well here. Um, so I don't know, like there's certain areas, of course, like sometimes there's been studies done that say Armenian people have on average two phones each. And that sounds like great accessibility to technology. But I guess it really depends on where you're working and when specifically. And if we're talking in a post-war context, I think that impacts it a bit differently than what Monique was looking at in data um, probably previously. But regarding transportation, I mean, that's a big part of Project Mighty is providing people with the transportation they need to get from rural Armenia um, to more hospitals in Armenia. And actually, while we're on the topic of hospitals in Armenia and babies, there is also still children that are kidnapped from the hospitals and then sold into orphanages that happened, um, you know, that, that has been happening historically. It slowed down in the past three years years, but it still happens. And one of the families we dealt with, um, the people who literally, we dealt with the people who, who stole this mother's child. And they do this to families who are not well equipped to take on the legal burden. Um, and so we also see a lot of illegal adoption situations and kidnapping that happens in the hospitals. And I thought I'd just bring that up. because we That's very interesting because that's a worldwide problem. And I didn't know we had that in Armenia. Yeah. It's oh, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. And I can connect you with some people if you want to help fundraise for them and their legal costs. So, you know, let's talk. <laughs> I, uh, I want to add that um, uh, poor women usually don't have an iPhone and they have a very rudimentary uh, phone uh, as a cell phone. So uh, with no internet connection. So, uh, you know, uh, I would take you to the grain of salt that outside uh, in the rural areas, we can reach out uh, completely to women. Um, we still have a long ways to go. Um, so that's a big problem for you, Monique, if that's the problem. So my data is uh, pre-war, so oh, you I know, see. Yeah. it's a different world now. Um, yeah, and that's what, that's what I reference, you know, it's hard because now we have to have a lot of research done in Armenia that is talking about this post-war situation. So, you know, all the researchers out there, pack your bags, we're waiting for you. <laughs> Monique, you had mentioned that the women um, who participated virtually were interested and hoped for the future to be able to meet in person. Um, were those rural women? Were those uh, just a, a blend of all the women who participated in, in your program? That, that link for camaraderie that I think all of us have, it's, um, it's uplifting to think that, that they benefited from your program and benefited so much that they wanted to reach out and meet the other women who were in it. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I mean, we really struggled with this, but of course we were limited with what was going on with the pandemic, you know, and we just didn't want to take unnecessary risk in um, having even one or two in-person uh, connections. But I think post pandemic, that will be an integral part because as a, as a, you know, as an educator, as a trainer um, and a coach, I, I, I know that it's, you know, I've seen the power of in-person connections. So um, I think blended uh, blended design uh, of, for programs is probably the best way to go. Blended meaning a mix of in-person and um, uh, virtual. So uh, yes, I mean, this, these women uh, were from all across Armenia, uh, from, you know, Artsakh to up north. And, you know, it, 
it's different when you're in person and you get to connect and really, you know, share stories and, and build bonds and build friendships. And, and I think sometimes in the places where they are, they don't have those opportunities. So can, you know, creating those opportunities will be really important uh, going forward. Um, but, uh, you know, we were, re- we were really limited with, with what we could do during the pandemic, unfortunately. Maro, I have a question that kind of goes back, you know, maybe 20 minutes pat into our uh, previous conversations. But when you mentioned that when women, the different stages that they go through when they come to your facility, and some of them um, are shattered, what kind of mental help can you give someone who is is just not able to help themselves? What What's that look like? Well, the the a center usually uh, should have a social worker that does the psychosocial uh, counseling. Uh, it has a psychologist. We also have a child psychologist because children also are affected by trauma uh, and lawyers. So this package, this it's a one stop, as we say, uh, that given whatever the uh, survivor wants, we offer. Now, many of them, they think that if we, we say to them, uh, would you like to see a psychologist? They would say to them, I'm not crazy. <laughs> and um, they, because they don't understand really what the psychology does. So we, 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 we see that the woman is very traumatized um, and she has uh, time and availability to come to, the, uh, to, the, to see a psychologist. We say that, you know, we help you to overcome some of the stress, you know, to, to get stronger. And with that, they really are. Uh, but sometimes they, they come, they feel it on them themselves that they need a psychologist. So uh, we offer that services. And, uh, um, uh, you know, these are not women with psychological problems. These are, I mean, we do have... Uh, uh, suicidal women with suicidal ideation and uh, strong depression and all that. And sometimes we have to recommend them to a psychiatrist for medication. But uh, overall, uh, women do not suffer from mental health. Mm-hmm. They are they come there to get stronger, to raise their self-esteem, um, to uh, start believing in themselves. Uh, maybe they have stress or depression to get away from or, or guilt. There's a lot of guilt involved. So we alleviate all these issues and um, um, get them stronger. Okay, so it looks like we're nearing the end. I'm not sure if there are topics that our speakers um, throughout this conversation that might come to you and we haven't addressed it. Uh, I can offer each speaker a few minutes to um, to give a recap or to share something that you might have thought of. Um, starting with uh, Monique and then Maro and then ending with Karine? Sure. So <clears throat> I think, you know, what's what's impacting me is I'm, I'm hearing uh, the other panelists and, and, you know, I'm very familiar with Maro's work and, and also Karine's work. Um, it's it just, you know, we are all diasporan women who have gone back to Armenia to make an impact. And you know, as being, you know, someone who is very committed to the progress of Ar- the Armenian nation, uh, I think that we all have a role to play in that. Um, and I think, you know, that's part of AWA's charter as well. Um, and AWA really role models that um, with the work they do in supporting programs on the ground in Armenia. Um, you know, fundraising is great and money is always helpful, but I think a lot of Armenian diaspora and women have, a certain skill set, you know, that they can bring to the table um, and contribute in developing the country uh, and empowering women. And one of the unique components that we added into our programs that I forgot to mention was a um, opportunity for diaspora and women who uh, specialized in, in different fields to, um, to give talks and seminars and coaching uh, to the women in our programs. Um, whether it was the leadership program or the entrepreneurship program, um, you know, there's so much knowledge and expertise in the di- diaspora that we could leverage. And I think it's one of the strengths of the 
Armenian diaspora is that we do have this um, big collective knowledge base, if you will, um, <clears throat> that can uh, really help in furthering um, gender equality and, and equality in general in Armenia. So I would just encourage, you know, uh, Armenian and non-Armenian women <laughs> to think about how they can give back. Uh, sometimes when you're not part of the culture or community, um, there might be some, you know, challenges like to understand how to get involved. But, you know, all of us here have um, connections and we're happy to connect uh, whoever wants to be involved in any of these initiatives. And there's plenty of work to go around. <laughs> so we, you know, so we really invite uh, women around the world um, to, to get involved and, and support these great initiatives. And um, that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Well, I, I should continue from what Monique said. Yes, uh, the I don't want to sound very patronizing from the diaspora that we bring in all the uh, know-how because it's a lot of the locals that uh, show us the way. Uh, but definitely uh, in terms of uh, social services and psychologists, uh, uh, these were two fields that were not developed during Soviet times and they continue to be underdeveloped now. We don't have really a school of social workers uh, well developed uh, with proper training. And um, uh, I personally also relied on the know-how of the diaspora and women psychologists and social workers who came from the diaspora and trained our local staff and that interaction and exchange of knowledge was very, very helpful. Um, uh, yes, there is a lot of need for interaction and exchange of information, uh, but also there is a need to really um, roll your sleeves and, and be here and work within the system for systemic change. This is so important because we cannot just do a project and think that we're doing good if we don't uh, think about the sustainability of the project. Mm -hmm. And I want to also put an emphasis that uh, there are a lot of young women uh, that have changed. The fabric of society has changed and it's normal to change and it, could, it will continue to change. That uh, from the 90s when I came to Armenia, I see now in the 2000s, uh, 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 um, a strat a level or I say um, women young women who are very emancipated feminist thought has been starting to trickle in, in into the young women there is a lot of activisms of young, young women uh, very uh, uh, modern very progressive and uh, organizations like uh, Quirix and what Karina does to engage them, it's very important because perhaps an organization like mine or like when Nicole worked, um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, or Monique worked, they're more established and more, um, uh, I, I don't know. Formal. Uh, formal, exactly. More professional, formal. Uh, whereas uh, Karine can engage these young women because we really need to bring them in and as a forum, as a platform for them to speak out. Many of them come from very conservative families and they don't have a possibility to speak out and express, as, as Karine has said, their, uh, their issues. So we need to engage these young women because in the future, they will take our place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, hopefully they will uh, um, continue the work and, um, and engage them and, and motivate them. And it's very, very important. And uh, this collaboration of formal and non-formal, professional, non-professional, there is a place, as Monique said, for everybody. Yes, and definitely. <laughs> and we fit together like a puzzle. And it's really beautiful <laughs> because culture really is what sustains these activist movements, music culture, fashion culture. And what I really want to emphasize in this talk is that Armenia is not just some land far away, you know, that has these old school rules. Yeah, there's problems and there's things we need to address. But there's also a really vibrant society here. The youth is so vibrant. And, you know, by having events where you incorporate music and activism and, and community art. and art, art is so important to the Armenian people. And I've been able to use art as a tool 
to really connect with everyone and share their art. And it's a conversation in and of itself. And sometimes those traditionalist people who are sexist and patriarchal, they don't understand it. And that's okay. Let them not understand that. I don't want them to understand it because what that allows people taking advantage of me as a girly girl who likes the color pink and posts all these stickers and sells stickers. That's how I started this entire, this entire organization. People didn't take me seriously as at first. And I could have been mad about that, but I'm not. Let those people that don't like me not take me seriously. Because at the end of the day, what matters is on the ground, where you're at and who you can access. And if you're speaking the same language as the masses and the youth, that's what matters because that's our future. And that's where I'm at. So thank you for supporting and everyone. power to the girls. Power to the girls. <laughs> we, we got it. Invest in Armenia. Invest in Armenian women because they're really talented. Yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. I think um, all who uh, have heard today and will receive the links uh, will be uh, inspired. I'm sure that they will look at your uh, each person's individual uh, websites. Uh, in closing, um, I would like to thank Maro, Karine, Monique, and Joan. Uh, I believe um, that our speakers today have shown consistent, tremendous leadership. They have shared with us um, that empowerment is the key to a successful life. And um, these women, our speakers, uh, they have real life stories. They are responsible and they are persistent. And they are building a collaborative support system between Armenia and the diaspora. Uh, to speak a little bit about AWA, AWA has always worked to promote women. And I just want to mention on our uh, awainternational.org website, we are actively accepting applications to help uh, people further themselves with their education. Um, the Los Angeles uh, affiliate has two uh, open active uh, scholarships, the Laurel Caribbean Fund for the Arts and the Hasmik Megardichian Scholarship. So please uh, look into that as well as uh, please save the date, October 2nd of this year, we will be celebrating our 30th anniversary in Newport Beach, California. So take a moment to look through our website. One quick shout out that I should have given earlier. I know Morrow's Women's Support Center is celebrating a milestone that she's had that for, for 10 years. So bravo, we look forward to supporting you in that. And um, once again, I would just like to thank Maro, Karine, Monique and Joan. And of course, the NGO CSW of New York. Our program has concluded.